Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about electronic switches and measures to protect them by looking at the case of a switch mode power supply. Last time I looked at the general problem and measures that can be applied in the case of a buck converter and today I will try out some of these methods on a practical board. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So today I will be working with the board I showed last time. It's a asynchronous buck converter built around the LM25085. And before trying to improve anything, it's best to measure a baseline. So what is the current status that you're trying to fix? Now because of the real life limitations of the measurement equipment, there are two main ways to measure things. So first to observe the voltage waveform amplitude in the switching node. The best way is by direct measurement with an oscilloscope and a probe. Now it's worth mentioning though that the measurement setup needs to be appropriately high frequency rated. So my oscilloscope has a 200 MHz bandwidth which is just on the limit of what we actually need. So the frequency that I will be measuring is very close to this value. So the exact precision will not be all that great. Ideally you want a measurement equipment that has a higher bandwidth than the signals that you are measuring. But that gets really expensive really fast. Anyway, with this direct probing measurement, will first of all tell us the peak high and low values, and secondly, which of the switches actually needs our attention. So if problems are occurring on the rising edge, then at this moment the low side switch is open and the high side switch is turning on. If problems are occurring on the falling edge, then at this moment the high side switch is open and the low side switch is turning on. So the exact point with a problem will tell us where exactly we need to work on the circuit. In our case, the main ringing and peak values are occurring on our rising edge. So here we are getting a peak value of around 15.5 volts and we can see that this ringing goes on for quite some time. So this is occurring when the high side transitions and the low side switch is open. Now if we check the other edge, the falling edge, well here we have a smaller voltage excursion and much smaller oscillation. Now the direct measurement is not ideal for evaluating the noise frequency because the added capacitance of the probe will most likely shift the frequency by a non-negligible amount. So with this setup on our rising edge we are measuring around 180 MHz. But that is not necessarily true. So for the exact ringing frequency measurement, I have this second setup in which I'm using a spectrum analyzer with a magnetic near field probe. So the idea here is that you can perform the frequency measurement without actually probing the circuit directly. So with this non-contact method, we can measure the ringing frequency without adding any extra capacitance into the circuit. Now, since the near field measurement is highly sensitive on the exact position of the probe in relation to the test circuit, I prepared this plastic housing which goes directly over the circuit and this will keep the measurement probe in more or less the same place over multiple measurements so that we can get comparable results. So if we run the setup like this, turn on the supply, get the probe in position and we make some adjustments on the measurement a bit. Well, then we get the typical noise spectrum of a switch mode power supply. At relatively low frequencies, we get our fundamental switching frequency, which is somewhere before the 500 kHz mark of the measurement. And well, then we get the various harmonics, which then slowly die down. And then at high frequency, we get the ringing. So this is occurring at around 200 MHz. Now, since I'm not using any sort of shielding when performing this measurement, the bit that appears here around 100 MHz is the local FM stations. So this particular set of spikes is not something to worry about. So now we know what our initial circuit is doing. Our main problem is the overshoot topping out at around 15.6 volts and the ringing at around 180 MHz. These are the values I will try to reduce today. So first thing to look at is the more or less free measures which involve the layout design. Because there's always a way in which you can make things far worse from the circuit layout. 
So there are two things to highlight today, which have a direct impact on the parasitic inductance of interest in our switching converter. So first of all is the size of our hot loop. The loop formed between the switching transistor, the diode, and in this case the input capacitors. Ideally you want to have this loop physically as small as possible to reduce the loop inductance. So to show a bad implementation, in this case here we have our diode, the switching transistor and then the input capacitors, but in between I intentionally added this snubber, which is a snubber going on top of the switching transistor. So maybe you want to play around with this one or with the other snubber. But anyway, since these two components are here, this will force the hot loop to be larger than well needed. So if you really want this extra snubber, this is not really the best location, since it will make your initial problem a bit worse. Now, the other way of reducing the inductance of a given loop, once making it smaller is no longer feasible, is to add a copper layer in close proximity. So this extra layer, say your bottom layer, will act as a short-circuited turn, which is magnetically coupled with your initial loop. Now, to more clearly highlight the effect of this, I intentionally left this massive hole on the other side, right beneath our hot loop, so that we can see the impact of leaving this opening well open, or filling it in with some copper tape, just so we can see how things will change. Now, since these measures will affect the exact ringing frequency of our noise, the best way to measure them is again using the spectrum analyzer and the near field probe. Now, I already prepared the measurements, so let's look at them one by one. So, for this experiment, I used three positions for our diode, here in the middle the proper intended position, so where the footprint is actually placed, one position closer to the transistor, which should yield minimal inductance, and then just for the fun of it, this other position, which is way further, which should create far more inductance. And after measuring the three setups, this is what we get. So this is the superimposed frequency spectrum for the three positions. Now at low frequency, where we have our switching frequency and the harmonics, not much really changed. The diode position does not have an effect on this, but our specific ringing related peak did indeed move. So we can see that the furthest position, marked with 1, yielded the highest inductance, since the frequency was the lowest, and then the other extreme, position 3, with the diode closest to the switching transistor, gave the lowest inductance, and thus the highest ringing frequency. So we went from 181 MHz in one extreme to 215 MHz in the other. To evaluate the impact of the ground, I made two measurements in which the diode stayed in the same position, but in one setup I did have the hole in the layout, and then I covered it up with some copper tape which I tried to solder in, so that it gives the best contact. If we look at the frequency spectrum, again we can see a clear difference, so low frequency stayed the same, but the high frequency behavior did vary, so the exact position of the peak changed, the first peak, the one with the full ground plane, did go to higher frequencies and it became slightly smaller. So here we went from 190 MHz to around 201. Now, just how much the inductance did change, we'll find out in a little while when we measure the circuit's parasitics. But for now, it's safe to say that these measures, adding a full ground plane close to the circuit and minimizing the hot loop size, should improve things since the lower parasitic inductance gives a higher damping factor. Next thing to look at is changes in components. For today, I will only change one component, the gate resistor, to highlight the effect on the switching slope. In general, a larger gate resistor will give slower transitions on the output of the transistor. But a simple resistor will affect both the rising and the falling edges. So it has a detrimental effect on efficiency in both cases, since the switching time is increased on both edges. You can, however, use a more complex gate driving network to partially solve this issue, by adding in a diode and an extra resistor. The idea here is that the gate is turned on through both resistors in parallel, and it's turned off only through one of these resistors. Thus, you can get separate control over both of the transition edges. So based on how the resistor values are chosen, where exactly the diode is put and into what direction, you can independently control the rise and fall times of the switch. 
but for the sake of simplicity, today I will be using the single resistor approach. However, when needed, this other circuit can also be used. For this measurement, again the oscilloscope and probe will give us the best results, since this will highlight the exact amplitude and transition time of our switching. Now, in general, the change of the gate resistor should not affect the exact ringing frequency, only the slope of the transitions. Now, to make things a bit more obvious, I already prepared the measurements. So, in one setup, I'm using a 0 ohm gate resistor, whereas in the other setup, I'm using a 10 ohm gate resistor. So, everything else stayed the same. And well, by measuring these two setups, so on the left side we have the 0 ohm, on the right side we have the 10 ohm. First of all, the slope ended up changing on both of the transitions. So on the rising edge we went from 2.5 nanoseconds to around 25. On the falling edge we went from 32 nanoseconds to 71. But crucially, for the problem we have today, it took our peak voltage way lower. So before we had around 15.5 volts, now we barely go over the 10 volts of the supply. So by increasing the gate resistance, we took the overshoot way down. So if you can spare some efficiency, this is a very powerful and simple method to improve on things. Last thing to look at today is the impact of an RC snubber. As highlighted last time, there are various ways to calculate the values, but these all rely on knowing the initial parasitics of the circuit. So let's start by measuring those. The general idea here is to measure the resonance frequency without and with adding some extra capacitance. So an extra physical capacitor from the switching node normally to ground. Based on the two resonance frequencies that are observed, as well as the known value of the extra capacitance, you can determine the initial parasitic capacitance and from there the initial parasitic inductance. Depending on the measurement method, you may also need to keep in mind the added measurement capacitance. So a direct measurement with a oscilloscope probe will add some non-negligible amounts of capacitance. This needs to be considered separately from the extra physical capacitor that you add into the circuit. So with an oscilloscope, the probe's capacitance will appear in both measurements. So I already went ahead and measured the resonance as is, so our initial measurement, and then measured the ringing with a 220 picofarad capacitor added from the switching node to ground. When measured with the oscilloscope probe, we had 179 megahertz to begin with, and we went down to 125 megahertz with the added capacitor. So using this data, we can determine that the power supply circuit plus the probe have around 209 picofarads of parasitic capacitance and 3.77 nanohenry of parasitic inductance. Now, taking things one step further, also comparing our oscilloscope probe measurement to the near field probe measurement, we had two different resonance frequencies, so 190 MHz for the near field measurement, 179 for the oscilloscope probe measurement, and knowing that the oscilloscope probe has around 23 picofarads, we can finally determine that the circuit has 185 picofarads of parasitic capacitance and, well, the 3.8 nanohenry that we had before. So our frequency difference in between the two measurements was this non-negligible amount from the oscilloscope probe. With a lower capacitance probe, then we shouldn't get such large differences. Using a similar calculation method, we can now determine the inductance variations and the absolute inductances that we had in our initial experiments. So starting off with the diode position, when we moved the diode further from the transistor, so increasing the hot loop, we increase the inductance by about 300 picohenries to a final value of 4.1 nanohenries. When we move the diode closer to the transistor, so to get the smallest possible hot loop, we decrease by about 0.9 nanohenries to a final value of 2.87. And well, when we played around with the ground plane, by adding in the copper filler, we decrease the inductance by about 0.47 nanohenry to a final value of 3.3 nanohenries. But anyway, in the final version of the board, I did keep the hole in the ground plane and the diode in its normal position. So taking the capacitance and inductance values that we measured for these two, we can determine various sets of snubber component values. So depending on the exact sets of formulas you use, you will get different sets of values. 
Now, based on the actual components I have at my disposal, I went with this bottom set. So the capacitance is somewhere between 1 and 4 times the parasitic capacitance, closer to 4 times, and while well, the resistance is larger than the square root of the parasitic inductance divided by capacitance, so 4.7 ohms. So these two components are the ones that I will be going with in my final test. So finally, we can confirm the operation of the snubber with both measurement methods. The oscilloscope to observe the overshoot and the near field measurement to observe the oscillation frequency and general noise spectrum. Looking at the general waveform first, well, overshoot, undershoot, everything is gone. Some small deviations still exist, but this waveform looks completely different than what we had before. If we zoom in, with the snubber circuit, we have a very decent 3.2 nanosecond rise time compared to the 2.5 nanoseconds we had before, and we still have a tiny little oscillation appearing. But it's nothing like the initial circuit. On the falling edge, again, no major difference other than the reduced amount of oscillation. So it's a much cleaner waveform, and we have similar fall times. Finally, in the near field measurements, we can again see that the oscillation completely disappeared. In pink we have the old trace and in yellow the new trace. The low frequency spikes again stayed more or less the same. It's just that this high frequency ringing associated peak has been completely removed. Last thing to discuss today is the exact components for the snubber circuit. What sort of parameters should you be keeping in mind when choosing the resistor and capacitor? So there are a few observations and assumptions to be made here. First of all, the voltage on the snubber capacitor will have enough time to reach the two voltage extremes that appear in the switching node during a switching cycle. So the power used by the snubber will be the power needed to charge this capacitor. The larger the capacitor, the more energy gets wasted. Of course, this power is also dependent on the exact voltage to which the capacitor is charged and the frequency. So the charging and discharging of this capacitor occurs in every switching cycle. The second important assumption is that the switch's internal resistance, RDS on if it's a MOSFET, is far smaller than the snubber resistor. This assumption will make all the power that is dissipated on the snubber to get dissipated on this snubber resistor. Last thing to observe is that the peak power dissipated on the resistor is dependent on the resistor's value. A larger resistor will have a smaller power peak, but the same amount of total power dissipation, which is determined by the capacitor. So the resistor's value does not influence the total power dissipation, it only impacts the exact peak value. And now if we come to our particular use case, the power supply was running at 250 kilohertz, our supply voltage was 10 volts, and to make things easy, we can say this is the excursion that the snubber sees, and well, with our given snubber components, we get a total power dissipation of only 17 milliwatts, but a peak power dissipation of 21.3 watts. So even though we don't really need a very large resistor, the power dissipation is very small, we can see this on a thermal measurement, it's running quite cold, however, we still need to choose a component that can actually withstand the peak power for short periods so that it doesn't get damaged over time. So, all in all, the snubber components that were chosen might not be perfect, a bit of fine tuning may still be necessary, but even so, they show a good improvement. A final thought about the snubber is that it does waste energy. Some power will get dissipated on it. Now, in general, a larger capacitor will reduce the oscillation and overshoot better, but it will also increase the losses. So, the best values include the largest resistor, and the smallest capacitor. That can ensure the switch components are working within their limits and the noise output is acceptable. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.